Okay, it's uh, day three, it's 12.45, and uh, the next talk is uh, an introduction to MEMS, and I uh, have recently noticed that I really need this introduction because I have no idea what is this is about. Uh, so please welcome the speaker, Jens Kaufmann. Hi, um, my name is Jens Kaufmann. I'm a PhD candidate in um, Harriet Watt University in uh, Edinburgh, and um, I'm working in MEMS. And um, MEMS, I think just a few people know what it is, and so I thought it's probably interesting to ask a few questions in the beginning, not in the end. So what are MEMS? What kind of MEMS are they? Um, how are MEMS made today? Why you will have problems to make this in your kitchen? Or do you even want to make them in your kitchen? And, but what are the alternatives to make them if you want some MEMS? So what I can't give you is um, like um, a substitution for a good book. Um, my uh, lecture on introduction to MEMS was two years. So I think I can't cover this in 30 minutes. And um, I can't give you like a, a recipe or a workflow to make your own accelerometer or make your own gyroscope. But what I can give you is like uh, a brief introduction in um, what are the key problems when you try to make very small structures? Um, what are the processes you use for this today? Or when you buy a product, how are they made? And um, what these products actually are? And um, which is, I think, the most interesting part is um, how we as hackers will be able to do them ourselves in the future. So MEMS are, is an acronym for Microelectromechanical Systems. Um, in Germany, you mo uh, hear mostly like microtechnology, Mikrosystemtechnik, MST, micromachining or microengineering. Um, when you're in the... In the um, English language, so they substitute this all the time, so take whatever you want. But um, what we're talking about is structures, devices, and phenomena where the critical feature size is within um, the range of the resolution of optic, uh, light, visible light, and the millimeter scale. So here you can see uh, several um, several features or machines or beings you can find in nature on the top and the length scale like this is a colibri which is about 10-12 centimeters then you have a hair here which has the diameter of about um, 100 microns then what you see here which is about 1 micron are uh, bacteria then you have a double helix which is just assumed it's not like it's actually looking. You can see it's computer generated in a very uh, easy abstraction of an atom, which is about one angstrom, which is um, uh, 10 nanometers, uh, a tenth nanometers. And here you can see what we have today in um, technology. This is a, a piezo drive uh, micro motor, a stepper. Um, this is. Um, uh, a gear with a coupling. You can see this is about 500 microns in diameter. And this is already nanotechnology. This is where uh, Berkeley is quite good. What you see here are receptors for uh, bacteria and um, the proteins they produce. So it's small. So what? Um, the problem is when you change scales that not all the effects are you usually working with changing in the same way. It depends on the dimension they're actually using. So if you have magnetics, they have like four dimensions. So when you shrink them down, they shrink by the power of four, which is quite rapidly. So what happens in the gravity and the mass shrinks with the power of three, electrostatics with two, and this explains why you will find uh, even a piezoelectric um, effects, and this is why you won't find like 
a conventional DC motor on the micro scale because the magnetic effect weakens so fast that the um, electrostatic uh, effect at some point is when you get small enough is bigger than the electromagnetic effect. That's what you always have to keep in mind. And the really bad thing is, like the van der Waals forces, they shrink with the power of a fourth. So that means that you, when you go very small, you have very big friction problems. You have a lot of stiction effect. So what you do is, for example, you have a candy lever, and this is touching the surface. This will never, never, ever go up again. Doesn't work. So these are some of the problems you're facing when you go there. But this is very theoretically. So, but what does it actually do, and how does an electromechanical system on a micro scale look like? This is a purely mechanical system from Sanjay Labor Laboratories in America, a gear, a gear shift. It's made out of uh, silicon, uh, silicon dioxide. And um, uh, this has like several uh, layers, and it's made in a surface micro machine, which I'm going to explain later. This is a standard accelerometer where you can see here there's like a candy lever with a seismic mass on the end. So when you move it up or down, this mass will always like be a little bit slower. It takes much longer to accelerate it, so it will bend, and then you measure the bending. But with this, you, can't, uh, you don't see any um, uh, electromechanicals. This is purely me mechanic, but what you can, what you can see here is a pressure sensor, and here you can see these are the embedded measurement structures. This is like a big membrane etched out of silicon. And here you have the, the, the sensors on the uh, four uh, edges of the membrane, which are then connected over aluminum. And so what you get is then basically a, a Watson bridge, where you can then read out the amount of how much the membrane is um, um, moving. So, and, but when you want to have a, a real system, you have to integrate it with, uh, with uh, uh, electronics because you want to have a standardized interface. You probably even want to have like already a file format, which is um, nice to have and easier than to um, implement afterwards. What you see here is. Um, <coughs> Uh, a standard accelerometer from um, uh, analog device, exactly. It's a ADXL202, so it measures in the range of uh, 2G in uh, one direction. This is the actual sensor, and all the rest of this is CMOS, all kinds of stuff. So you have self-test, pre-amplifying, then um, resistor load, buffers, whatever you want. You can already integrate in this way. Sometimes it depends on um, the um, process you're using to generate the actual mechanical part. You can't do this. So what you do then is hybrid integration. So you have here the actual, um, the actual chip, which is doing all the calculations and stuff. And this is the microsystem here, over here, the mechanical parts. And this all is a ceramic carrier, which has embedded uh, connections so that you basically take the electronics part away from the mechanical part. And a few resistors, which is uh, quite good to see how big they are. They are SMD. They are the smallest resistors you can buy, just that you get like a, a length scale here. Um, what other MEMS are there? This is a little bit confusing because uh, in English, you always, uh, the most time they use the term MEMS for everything, even if there's no mechanical part involved at all, which is like this. This is a, um, a DNA uh, measurement chip. They are basically just an array of electrodes which are fed out to the outside with a spe special coding that they can uh, um, measure the, what it's actually doing and how much it is. Then MOEMs, which means uh, micro-optical electromechanical systems. You, um, and this is a very good example because you can buy products with this. This is a micro-mirror array. As far as I remember, it's from TI. 
Um, and what you can see is that there are a lot of small dots, and they're not just pixels, they are really like small mirrors, as you can see them here. This is like a, a bigger magnification of it. So you have here some kind of springs. Here you have the mirror itself. And all the mechanics, this is not the real color, how it looks. This is like uh, colored afterwards. So what you see here is like a, a alumin aluminum sputtered onto the surface. Sputtering is some kind of deposition process. And all the rest is made out of silicon and then folded over. And this mirror, um, for example, is a different one than to the micro mirror array before because this is able to move in two angles. How big is that? Um, the pixel size here is about, uh, I think the whole thing was here 120 microns. So this is about 80, I would say. And it's really nice, it's really nice. And this is something, as I said, you can't make in your kitchen. <laughs> um, this is quite interesting for all the communication guys because this is actually how it looks if you have a fiber hub or if you have a good one because this is a mechanical shutter for glass fiber. Yeah, uh, and the fiber is about 500 microns. And what's quite nice here, this is self-assembling structure. So they're making that one and then they switch, uh, flip a switch and then it comes up by itself. It's done by, um, what's it called, um, electrostatic force. And then, um, yeah, there you go. Um, here are some RF, not quite yet MEMS. This is one of the processes we had just uh, implemented in, uh, in Edinburgh. This is um, a plastic uh, glued onto a, a, a vial, glass vial, with some metal tracks. I think you can see them. And they are not like um, made in a conventional way. They're like laser direct righted. It's really nice. So you can write metal tracks onto plastics with a UV laser, if you're happy to have one. And uh, these, if someone is working like with robots, he probably appreciate what this is. This is a transformer, a high uh, frequency transformer made in Liga technology so that you up uh, in the uh, that you have a higher switching frequency so you have less losses and so on. This is um, five pens, uh, five British pens. These are some tweezers so just that you get the um, the whole thing is uh, for I think from here to here it's about uh, 10 millimeters the whole transformer and it has magnetic core. So this is quite nice. It's made basically out of two halves and then bonded together. Here are the connections for one winding, so they're continuous windings. Yeah, then you have many, many more different applications and uh, structures for all kinds of problems. Uh, what I was showing was mostly so far uh, sensors, because uh, I know more about sensors than about actors. Um, but you can have this for all kind of physical uh, field you want. You can have for mechanics, for thermal problems, for, even for magnetics. But I said this is uh, really, really difficult. So you need uh, meter materials, and you have to do a lot of material science there. And but even uh, in optics, they are like increasing, increased use of uh, microsystems because you don't need big structures for light. You, light is very small, so it works quite good. And um, chemical uh, receptors are um, uh, becoming bigger and bigger, and especially biology is uh, very interested in small structures because then they can work with less uh, hazardous material, hazardous material than they're used to, and this is always uh, a nice thing, a nice thing to have. So, what are the advantages of this? Yeah, if you have a specific problem in a specific size. Then you try to shrink it and get rid of the problem. For example, if you have magnetic interferences in your part 
and you can make it very small, then it doesn't matter anymore. And you have different problems like random tunneling um, um, electrons or something, but if you don't care, that's fine. Then you can make much more parts in, on, in, uh, with very, very good processes, and so you, and they're all batch processes. So you, when, if you have, like you start up with a three inch wafer, which is about this size, and you get 100 um, chips on it, and, um, or 100 microsystems, and you just go one inch bigger, and so you can do with the same process much more because it increases uh, over the area with the, uh, by, the scale, uh, by the power of two. Then you can, basically it's all about, we want to make it safe and cheap. So a uh, few problems are still there. For example, detection. You can't, uh, as I said, magnetic sensors doesn't work. So handling integration is when you have very small parts, you need very precise, precise tools to work with them. Otherwise, um, you, ne you never will be able to make something like this. Or even, the, it's one thing to make it, but then put it in a package that someone else can use it. It's also a big issue in, the, in uh, MEMS. And um, as I said before, friction is a big problem. And then what is it is very typical for, especially in, in like uh, fundamental science of microsystems is you have a microsystem which is about five, 500 microns altogether. And then you have a lab view set up next to it with three different computers, logic analyzers and stuff, and such a power supply, which is not really like that's not what you want. Um, but there are like um, a lot of research at the moment going on to like harvest energy from surrounding um, energy sources. Like RFID is one of the most famous ones, but you can also use like a special kind of accelerometer to harvest movement and make um, current out of it or power. Yeah, this is like what MEMS basically are. And I want to show you three standard processes, two in silicon and uh, one which is not in silicon. This is standard bulk micromachining. If you have a car with a, with a wireless pressure sensor on all your tires, you will have something like this in it. So what you have is you take a piece of silicon, put some uh, silicon dioxide on top of it. Silicon dioxide is basically glass. So you can use uh, chemical uh, deposition, chemical vapor deposition. You can use magnetic enhanced chemical vapor de deposition, but it doesn't matter. You put glass on top of it. Then you take um, a thin film resist, which is like a photoactive polymer, put it on top, structurize it with uh, light, and then you have openings wherever you want the openings to the actual glass, the, and then you take HF um, and etch the glass open, and then you can use KO etch to structurize the material below. Because um, when you etch with um, uh, HF, it will, st it will stop here on the silicon, it won't etch the silicon, and then you take KOH um, to shape basically the structure below the silicon. Um, what you also can use is uh, dry etching, like reactive iron etching, but this is something which is very, very, very expensive, and um, it's very slow, but you have really, really nice structures out of this. Um, and why you use KOH is basically because you can get structures like this, so you um, as I show you later is that silicon is not etching in all the direction right away. So if you have like a, a piece of metal and you start to etch it, then you will have like a mushroom shaped cutout, but you won't have this, you won't have this uh, uh, when you use silicon, show later why. So you make an opening like this and then you will basically under etch here the candy lever and then you have a free candy lever and this accelerometer. 
then the other one is surface micromachining. That works different. With bulk micromachining, you were like um, working on the material you have originally. When you do um, um, surface micromachining, you build up new structures on top. So what you first use is like a silicon substrate. Um, then you grow with the same technologies that you use for the glass. You um, grow um, phosphor silicate, and then the same again. You etch it, you structurize it, but then what you do is you take the silicon, uh, the, the phosphor silicate, you take away again. And then you have also like free structures. And you, with this, you can make um, all kinds of moving parts. You can do micro motors, you can do um, uh, gears, um, gyroscopes. Gyroscopes are normally using this technology because it's quite good to um, handle. This is a gyroscope, by the way. So this is surface micromachined and um, silicon. And this is a housing uh, made out of uh, Pyrex glass because it has a similar uh, coefficient of thermal expansion so that you don't get any stresses in it. So, and this is, this is the neat thing with silicon and why they still use it. Silicon is, uh, when, you, when you buy a wafer, which looks like one of those, it's like a normal silicon three-inch wafer, um, they're actually made quite neatly. So they have a big, big uh, uh, beaker of molded uh, silicon in there. And then they have an imp crystal and turn this all the time and slowly pull it out so that you get a big silicon sausage. And then you slice the whole thing to get these small uh, wafers. And then you polish it that you have like defined properties on it. And um, because of this, you have the whole behavior is determined by the crystalline structure. It's just one crystal. Not like glass, where everything is like inside each other, how the nature made it. This is really uh, engineered material, almost. And so it's etching differently in different ways, because there are like planes in the crystal, and it suddenly stops there when you etch something. And this is why you get this strange appearance. And you will always get this angle here, which you normally don't have in other materials. And these are like the um, planes you have in the crystal. But this is like... Explaining this is a three-hour lecture, so I don't want to bore you any further with this. And um, show you another process which uh, was uh, developed uh, in Germany. It's LIGA. It's an acronym for Lithographie Galvano Abform, or um, Lithography Electroplating um, Inkjet, uh, not inkjet, printing, um, um, no, no. What, what you do is injection molding. So you basically press uh, a plastic afterwards in it, up form. That's what you do. And uh, show you how it works. So normally you have a carrier and resist on top of it, and it's a thick film resist. Um, depends on the method you're using. Um, you can use uh, PMMA, acrylic glass, or uh, SU8, which is a really nice to handle um, um, resist. Then you uh, structurize it, start the, uh, the electroplating process, and grow over the structure. Then you remove the whole thing from the structure and start to um, press the plastic in it to reproduce uh, the structure you had originally, which is very cheap because you can do a lot of them quite quickly, and it's standard technology. You can put this in any workshop, and they will do it. So, can we do it too? Not quite yet. Few problems are there. The biggest problem is you need a clean room. This clean room, if it's stopping here, costs about a million uh, euros just on uh, 
air conditioning and temperature control, but without the folks in there. If they go in there, it becomes more expensive. <laughs> Honestly, when you're uh, in the cl small clean room and you have three people there, try to be there at 9, because after 12 o'clock, you won't get any uh, good results anymore uh, because of particle impact. And people are moving, so you get turbulences. It's really bad. So what they're doing is like laminar flow from the top to the bottom. So all, all the uh, um, tiles you see on the top, they are basically just like uh, nets where they blow air through and suck it away here on the bottom. And also here, all the tables, they have holes that the particles can settle down and get sucked away. Yeah, why should you never hold a wafer like this? Because you can get contamination from top. So if you hold it that way, it's much harder to get particles on it. So when you, when you check your wafer, you check it that way, not that way. <laughs> Especially when you're wearing a beard. Big problem. And um, oh, smoking. Smoking is really bad. Um, when you smoke, for the next two hours, you will spy, really spit out large amounts, so like 10,000 per breath of particles uh, bigger than 25 microns. They look like meteors in your structures. Uh, I have one here. This was just lying in a clean room, not in a clean room, for about a week. These are structures, they are fairly large, about 20 microns. Yeah, and this is dust. So, and as I, as I said before, so normally you should have less than 1,000 particles, or oh, there's something missing, per square foot uh, in, the, in the clean room, uh, bigger than 5 microns. And this is how big? 40 microns? So, forget it. You will have a yield in your structures, which is not good if you work like this in standard process. Tja, this is um, a very old-fashioned um, pressure sensor. So you have the membrane on the back side and you etch from the back side, so you have to align here your connection structures to the back side, which is already a problem. And then here you will have a small uh, doted areas, like with imprinted ions, so that you get like more or less uh, electrons in there, depends on what you're doing. And you have to connect them with the accuracy of repeatable 5 microns, which is really, really a big problem when you try to align this by hand, for example. I've done this, it works, but just once in a day. So you have, you, it needs like three, four trials until you really get something out. You can do this in science, where you have like three years to do your project, which normally would take an industry six months, but it doesn't work uh, if you have to pay for it. These are this, uh, some kind of alignment structures. This is about uh, the 10 microns, um, the, the um, width of the lines here. Um, it looks a little bit like scratched. This is because it's in a foil. I never took it out, this one, so far. Um, these are like the windings I showed you before of this uh, transformer. So, but they are about 50 microns. That's also a problem. When you use HF, HF is not a strong acid, but the problem is that it will just diffuse through your skin you're not recognizing it, and the F, the fluor in it, will substitute the um, CL, the calcium in your bones, and so your fingers start to wobble. You don't like that. And uh, it's irreversible, so they will take your hand off. So be, be really careful if you ever try to mess around with, um, with uh, uh, HF. It's not nice. There's always hope, isn't there? And these are the first um, approaches. Um, what you see here is um, a self-reproducing 3D printer from uh, a guy named Adrian Boyer in um, 
somewhere in England. N not sure quite yet. Um, it's relatively big, so microstructures won't work because the, um, the structures, the smallest feature size you can have is about half a millimeter so far. But fabbing is the way to go. Fabbing is basically um, desktop manufacturing. That means you have a box, and out of this box, and with a computer on it, and then you think about what you want to do. You make a 3D representation in your computer, and then you print it out. Or you get the BitTorrent of the new iPod and print it out. That's the idea. Um, yeah, what you're trying to do is like really make f uh, physical objects from digital representations. The mostly or the mostly used, almost fabbing tools at the moment are rapid prototyping machines. And um, since two years, there are um, like a growing community around two projects. One is Fab at Home, it's an American project, which is not self-reproducing, and uh, the RepRap uh, project from England, which is um, more promising for us, because the nice uh, thing on this project is, if you have one, or let's say, uh, yeah, you, you have one, then you can print out the next one. And if there is a revision, like point two point something, then you print out the revision and attach it to the old machine. It's really nice. And um, can show you what's already around. Um, this is really, really, really impressive. This is uh, from the uh, Laser Tech Institute in, Han in Hanover. Um, these are um, photolithographic generated spiders, and they are 60 microns. So your hair is about that size, just to give you some impression about the size. Um, this is uh, also quite interesting. This is uh, a SEM uh, picture of a selective uh, laser sintered. Um, part from the uh, Hochschule mit Weide. This is basically the same technology than used in the wrap wrap, just a little bit more accurate. Um, and this is done on the University of Tokyo. And then you have also this uh, polymer jetting, which is basically a modified inkjet printer, which is quite nice, but I haven't seen microstructures on it yet, but I think it's just a matter of time in the very near future. Because when you see how accurate uh, uh, printers are already today, then you can guess what kind of uh, microstructures, uh, 3D structures you can print them. <laughs> um, I want to explain the more promising, or the, the ones where I've actually seen already microstructures on it in a little bit more detail. So this is how stereolithography works. So you have here some kind of piston which moves the elevator. And it will start up here, just below the surface that you have like a thin layer on um, photo uh, liquid photoresist on top. And then, and then your laser comes, writes the structure on it, and it will photo cure it. So it uses um, the, um, the light energy to initiate a polymerization uh, process and become stiff. And if it has done this, then it will go a little bit farther down and will write the next slice of your 3D structure. You need supporting structures, of course, um, but what they normally do to uh, don't have like lump lumbers everywhere is that they like do it uh, with the cone on top of it so that you have a very small uh, point of uh, connection and then you break it away. Next one is selective laser sintering which has some advantages because you don't have to stick to the uh, photo uh, polymer so you can basically use any kind of material you can heat up 
and it will liquefy and then stick together. And this is what's happening here. So you have two pistons, and there's a lot of powder in there. So you move the powder, uh, you will move this piston a little bit up, so you get a certain amount of powder on it. Then you roll it over in the other one, which has like um, a small cavity here, and then it will fill it up until the top, and then you will write with your laser on it and basically weld it together. The um, advantage here is that you don't need supporting material because it will support itself. And then you take it out afterwards, take like an air jet and just blow it out and your structure is done. And then this is again like uh, the wrap wrap works. So you have a Cartesian robot which is like working this in X and Y and probably this in Z or you directly have the Z on the nozzle. And these are two different thermoplasts with uh, different uh, uh, thermal properties. So, for example, one will liquefy at 200 degrees, the other one at 400 degrees. So you use the 200 degrees one to make support structures and basically really extrude them out in lines so that you get your structure this way. And then you can extrude the other one on top put it back in the oven about 300 degrees, so the support material will melt away, the other one will still stay. Um, this is the other project, um, the, the Fab at Home project, which is really nice for future technologies because there's a, all the microsystems today are made by photolithography, so the mask you use for the initial structure, structurizing is done by a photosensitive polymer, and you need a big photo lamp and a mask to basically do it, or a laser. And what this does is, this is like uh, printing out the polymer just where you need it, and so you don't need the photo step. And then you can etch away, or you can grow something within the mold. That works really nice. The only problem is that this is too big right now, to, uh, not accurate enough to make actual MEMS. But it will become cheaper and better. Um, what you can see here is a trial where someone was basically electroplating. So you have like a cathode and an anode and a solution of a metal salt. And then normally you switch on your current and then uh, the metal part of the uh, salt will go to one way and the other one, uh, the other part goes to the other uh, electrode. But what he does is like, he is able to localize plate it and so make tracks and whatever you need. But you need a conductive surface. This is how electroplating, a scientific electroplating uh, place looks. <laughs> it's a current source, a beaker, a heater and a steerer. So this is something you can do in your kitchen, except of the sulfuric acid you need for it, smoking. Here's, again, the laser direct writing. Uh, and what's the neat thing on this is you can make it on any 3D surface, so you can make very weird structures. We're working at the moment on um, like folded structures and uh, free forms. And this is really promising. And then there's powder blasting. Powder blasting is basically the same as sand blasting, just with, a, uh, with smaller particles. And with this, uh, the machines are about uh, 4,000 pounds is 6,000 euros if you make it yourself. And um, then you can make an accelerometer without a problem. And this is something which fits very nicely in your garage. <laughs> so what you basically have is an XY table with your nozzle, which uh, blows out the powder, and you need a metallic mask on it. And this is normally done by a laser cutted mask, but um, I can show you this later if you want. This is made out of normal PCB board, and um, Normally they say copper doesn't work because it's like um, uh, wearing off too quickly with the alumina, 
but this is like the hardest uh, um, process we can run on this machine, and it's still sticked after 400 microns of digging into the PCB board, so that works fine. So you can do this with a, with a laser printer, with an iron, and a powder blasting machine. You can make something like this. Yeah, and now the only question is, do you want to make your own steam engine? <laughs> Thank you. Questions? <laughs>